Great, thank you. Um, so good morning slash afternoon to everyone. Uh, thanks for attending. Uh, today's topic is uh, customizing and using the Vault data standard. So this is a tool that I think a lot of people still don't use um, with Vault. Um, I'll admit when I first started, when it first came out and I first started seeing it or using it, um, I wasn't a big fan just because it seemed like it added a lot of effort to what you had to do. But um, ultimately, especially in larger environments, it can be um, incredibly useful, um, not just for making sure that the right information gets associated with uh, your documents, um, but also there's some pretty neat things you can do with it um, to kind of customize Vault um, without going through like a ton of effort of building a custom add-in and um, you know messing with the UI and, and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. So um, it's pretty interesting. I've been able to do some some pretty interesting things with it. Um, so today's uh, webcast is going to be about we're going to start because I'm guessing a lot of people don't know much about the data standard or what it can do. So we're going to start with um, how to get it installed and and how to use it. Um, installation has changed a little bit recently. It's gotten easier to find as long as you know where to look for it, I guess. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about customizing the UI. That's one of the really powerful things about the data standard is it's depending on what you need to do. It can be fairly straightforward to customize the behavior. Um, you always have to weigh the the pros and cons of customization you know, versus what it, you get out of it, but but it's pretty straightforward to do depending on what you need to do. Um, uh, I think a, a dramatically underused feature of Vault data standard is the ability to create new documents directly in Vault. Um, I think it's, it's really useful for things like Office documents, but um, it has some interesting applications for inventor files as well. Um, and then we're going to finish up with um, like I mentioned, you can use the data standard as kind of a way to hook into Vault to provide some custom behavior um, without buying any other software. It's just a matter of, of some programming effort. So we're going to take a look at an example of that too. Um, so as we go, feel free to put questions into the question pane. Um, if the questions are relevant to what I'm talking about at the time, I might address them as we go. Otherwise, I'll do my best to address them all at the end of the presentation. So let's get started with how you might get this installed if you don't already have it installed. Um, the first thing to know is this only works with Vault Workgroup and Vault Professional. Vault Data Standard does not work with Vault Basic. Um, Vault Basic really is just check in, check out, work in progress stuff. It's not designed to be used by you know people outside of the CAD users. Um, it's not designed to really maintain a revision history or or do a lot of you know metadata manipulation. Yeah, it has properties, and yeah, you can you know interact with the properties on documents. But in Vault Basic, the properties more about how do I find stuff. Um, in Workgroup and Pro, the metadata becomes a little bit more important because you typically will have people outside of engineering either directly interacting with Vault, or you might be putting that pushing that data downstream. Say, for example, you're extracting bombs from inventor assemblies in Vault Pro and you want to get that into ERP, um, it becomes a lot more important to make sure that your metadata is all present and correct uh, before you, you know, extract that information to put it into ERP. Um, so again, keep in mind Vault Data Standard only works with Workgroup and Pro. Um, now, depending on what version of Vault you're using, uh, how you get it installed and how you get it and install it is a little bit different. Um, if you're still using 2018 or something older, um, you've got to find the download package for it. Um, it used to be that the data standard was something you could get on the uh, product enhancements page of your Autodesk account. Um, now I don't know that it's even there anymore because that enhancements is sort of gone and it's just product updates. Um, but there is uh, a link if you Google um, 2018 Vault Data Standard. There's a forum post somewhere that basically says 
yeah, go and get the 2018.3.2 update, which is actually a full installer. Um, because the Vault Data Standard is really just a series of add-ins for Inventor, for AutoCAD, for Vault. Um, and while, yes, there's an installer for it, and yes, you can install and uninstall like you would any other program, um, if you just have the files that make the add-ins work, um, for the most part, that might be good enough. Um, now, with 20, Vault 2019 and Vault 2020, um, the installer has actually been included as part of the Vault client installation package. Um, so you would go to Tools and Utilities um, and then do the install from there. And I'll show you that in just a minute. Right. So if you've been wanting to try out the data standard and you heard about it before and heard it was a separate download and you can't find it anymore, if you're using a new version, just launch your Vault client installer and you can get it installed. So what kind of things can you do with the data standard? Um, its primary purpose, as far as, as I understand it and what I think, the way I think of it is, it makes it easier to capture um, you know, the metadata that you need associated with your files right at the beginning. Um, or, and you may not know all the metadata right away, right? But those things that whoever's creating the document, being a CAD document from a CAD application or an Office document from within Vault, um, whoever's creating that document probably knows something about the file. And so if you can have them fill out that information at the beginning while they're doing it, you don't have to risk forgetting it later or having to do it later and maybe getting it wrong, having someone else do it, et cetera, right? Um, so we're going to see it, it revolves heavily around, you know, essentially a properties page. Um, but it also lets you do some other things. Um, for example, categorizing documents. Um, Vault Workgroup and Vault Pro, the behavior of files is driven uh, by their category, right? That's the easiest way to define behavior on, on a file is to say, put it in a category that defines its life cycle and, and what its default life cycle is, its revision schemes, what properties are associated with it, and maybe, you know, what properties are required. Um, you know, so putting a document into a category in Vault um, conveys a lot of behavior onto that document. So if you can get the document into the right category right away, um, that behavior is all preset. Now, there are rules in Vault that you can set up and say, if the file extension ends in IPT, put it in the part category. Right, but what happens if you have three different categories for parts, like purchased and made, and you know standard or something? Um, you know, you somehow have to get that file categorized properly. And if you don't have, the only way to do that really is with some property about the file. And if you don't have that property correct up front, which the data standard can help you with, or if you don't set the category right. Um, that behavior is not going to be there. And so if you just check a part into Vault, you may then have to, you know, change category manually and, and then maybe you forget to do it or maybe you pick the wrong category. There's a lot of different ways, you know, things can go wrong. Um, so again, the data standard would let you categorize stuff right up front. Um, it also provides a nice way of reviewing the metadata about a file, the properties of a file. Um, you've got data sheets to look at. And so it can um, sort of curate that really long list of properties that you see in Vault about any random file. You know, if we look at any document over here and look at our properties pane, you see there's a whole lot of property information over here. Right, some of it relevant, some of it you don't really care about. Right, um, Vault Data Standard can make it easy for us to filter what we're seeing there, so that we're only seeing um, relevant information based on the file category. Um, it also provides a way to create new documents directly within the Vault. Like I said before, um, I actually use this literally every day. 
uh, I write a lot of proposals and um, I use Vault to manage my proposals. I have a template I use for those proposals. And so Vault lets me create a new proposal based off a template straight away. Um, so I don't have to find something open, save as, right? I can put appropriate property information on it so I can find those proposals later on. Um, you know, it's a, I think it's a great tool. Um, and then, of course, this is something that I learned fairly recently, and um, we actually have a customer that's deployed this in their environment. Um, you can use the Vault data standard to add custom commands to the UI. Um, and then those commands can execute PowerShell scripts. And then in conjunction with any code you put in that PowerShell script, but also um, a little tool set called PowerVault uh, by Cool Orange, um, which is free, by the way, um, you can use that to make it pretty easy to do some neat things um, with Vault. Um, the example that I'm thinking of, we have a customer that uses Vault now, we'll be putting it in production soon to create new quote documents. So Vault's managing you know, non-CAD data for quote purposes, um, where when they create a new quote, it automatically goes that based on the type of quote, it uses a certain template, it puts it into a life cycle in the right state um, so that the right people see it and can take action on it. Um, and Vault automates the entire front end of that process. So the quote's just there and ready to start work. Um, <clears throat> and I've got another example to show you here on the webcast that's different from that one. Um, so let's talk about installing and using to start with. So the absolute basics and, you know, I think <clears throat> this is something that, you know, I won't say everyone can use this, but a lot of people can make use of it, I think. And it's very straightforward um, to use. Um, it's very straightforward to deploy. Uh, in its default configuration, it's very capable, and all you need to do is install it, and it's working, right? Um, so like I mentioned before, it includes add-ins for Inventor, AutoCAD, and Vault. I didn't list Vault there, but but it's a, there's an extension for Vault as well. Um, and again, it lets you provide metadata, um, the category, property information, et cetera. Um, but it also can enforce that collection if you've got required properties. Um, so you can set things up to where unless someone provides the information that you say is vital, they can't save the document. They would have to disable the add-in. And there's a way to do that because sometimes you don't need it, right? So I'll show you how to do that. But um, you can make it to where um, people are not just reminded, but kind of forced to provide the information that they should provide about something. Um, when they know it, right? But also, again, reviewing metadata. The data sheet is very nice. Um, and that data sheet's available both in the Vault client and in the CAD application. All right, so let's take a quick look at this. Installation is pretty straightforward. Um, you just go to your Vault Pro client installation media. Um, I'm always a big fan of downloading the installation media from the subscription site versus um, installing over the web, because if you ever need to launch the installer again, it's pretty straightforward. You've got it somewhere and you just get to it. Um, right. But once you launch the installer, you just go to install tools and utilities. Now, in my case, um, we're going to see the data standard. I've already got it installed for Vault and Inventor. I don't have it installed for AutoCAD because I don't have AutoCAD on this particular machine. So that's another thing to note, and this is just a, a, a fundamental order of operations best practice thing anyway. If you're installing the Vault client, you always install your CAD applications first and install the Vault client last. That way the Vault installer can recognize what CAD applications are already installed, install its add-ins, and then also if you need to install the data standard, um, it'll let you pick these guys because they're, they're, the CAD applications are already there. right? Installation, like I said, I can't do it here, but installation takes literally seconds to do. Um, and then, you know, you'll want to have your applications closed as well so that when you launch them again, the add-ins are able to launch. All right, so installation is very straightforward. Um, if you're using 2019 and 2020, if you're using 2018, you've got to go and get the, the update. Um, I didn't go so far back as 2017 to look and see where that is. Um, if you're using something 2017 or older and you want to use this data standard but you can't find it anywhere, um, feel free to send me an email 
um, or you know, type in the question pane or leave a comment at the um, at the end of the webcast, and we can probably you know track down the installer for you if you need it. Now, as far as using the data standard, um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm going to use Inventor for the CAD application to show this, but you'll notice there's a tab here at the top for data standard. Um, one of the most important things to know about the data standard is you can disable it. Um, it doesn't disable the add-in, it just turns off um, the functionality temporarily. And the reason you'd want to do that is because of the way data standard works. So if I have a new file here, I'll just create a new part. Now, the first time I save this document, the data standard dialog is going to appear. So this is what the data standard dialog looks, these, looks like these days. Um, over here on the left are some static properties that are, in this case, vital to every document, right? The category it's going to go into, um, Vault Data Standard does integrate with Vault Numbering schemes. So if you use Vault Numbering, and especially if you have multiple available schemes, this lets you pick between the schemes easily. Um, if you're not going to use a scheme, you can type the file name in here, and then Somewhat arbitrarily, the comments property is over here on the left as well. Um, on the right, you see all of the properties that are related to this category, and in the case of Inventor, are also mapped to Inventor files. That's the trick, and that's the easiest way to quote unquote customize the Vault Data Standard UI is to set up your properties in Vault because the data standard will read Vault property configuration. It will determine based on what category you have selected, what properties are relevant to that category, in this case, for inventor files specifically. So if you've been trying to configure data standard and you've added a property in Vault and you want to see it here, but you can't see it, um, you're going to want to map that to some standard or custom property of the inventor file. Because the idea is the properties you see here should be the ones that are relevant to the inventor document because that's what we're saving, right? I think that's the logic behind that, right? So, um, and I don't know, I think I do, standard, here we go. No, nope, I didn't modify that yet or I didn't make it uh, required, um, but Another thing about this is any property that is required, that you've marked required for a given category, um, will be outlined in red over here. Um, and the OK button won't be available. You won't be able to push it. Um, so if you want to force someone to provide property information, um, you can require the property be filled out um, and you do that in Vault in your property definition. So let's just say uh, product line for the uh, standard category, right? Um, so if we look at our standard category, product line, you would go to your Vault configuration, look at your properties, and for product line, for the standard category, you would say it requires value, and that's true. Um, now, I had already set that, and I knew I had set that, so I'm not 100% sure why um, it's not forcing me to fill this out. I've done a lot of work to this system over the last few days, <laughs> um, prepping for the webcast, so it's absolutely possible I did something to, con to the configuration files. Um, so I'm just going to restart Inventor just to see if that fixes it. But if it doesn't, um, the way it manifests is you would see a red outline um, in the field that the user needs to fill out. Um, and you wouldn't be able to press OK um, unless you filled out all of the required properties. Right? So it can absolutely force users to do the right thing and provide the property information that they're supposed to provide. So it is important to note, too, that you've got to be logged into Vault to use the data standard because it directly communicates with Vault to get property definition information, et cetera.
There we go. So yeah, so see how this is in red? So it shouldn't be empty. And I cannot press OK until I fill out. I put something in this field. Right. Now you can also assign a numbering scheme. And we'll notice with the numbering schemes, um, if there are choices to be made, you can still make those choices. So it integrates with the, the vault numbering schemes, the list, et cetera. Um, now, in addition to the property information, one of the most useful things about the data standard here is this little bit right here that says folder. And this is one of the more, I think, confusing things for new users of vault. And it has to do with um, where do files go? When I'm saving a file, if the data standard isn't enabled, I'm just presented with my local workspace. And I need to know, you know what folder in my local workspace, I need to know how to get to the location in Vault where this thing should be saved. Um, and if I don't have that folder in my workspace, um, I can't save to it, right? I've got to go to Vault. I've got to find the folder, right, and then go to working folder, get it on my workspace. That's the safest way to do it, right? So if this folder wasn't here, let's just nuke this folder, right? Um, EP3 is not here. So I have to make that folder. The dangerous way to do it is to make it, because then you might have a typo. Um, it could be really confusing for new users. But if you're using the data standard, this is a little breadcrumb type thing where you actually pick in the vault, this is showing me vault folders, where this file should go. So even if I don't have that folder in my local workspace, this is where the data standard is going to enforce that file having been saved. Right, and I'll pick a just the sequential numbering scheme here. And notice as soon as I press OK to save the file, it's also going to immediately check it into Vault. So essentially what Data Standard does is it sort of makes it to where you're now kind of working and saving directly in the Vault context, as opposed to working and saving in your workspace and then checking in. Now it's still functionally behind the scenes is the same thing. You're still saving a file to your local disk. And when I finish pressing OK here, we'll take a look at that. It's still going to be in my local workspace. It's still going to be in this folder. But this keeps everything straight, right? It's in the vault now, in the EP3 folder, that file that I just created, right? Um, and it's in my local workspace in that folder. So it took care of creating the folder that I needed in my workspace wherever it needed to be to get the file checked into the right spot. So it can sort of abstract away to some degree the local workspace. Um, so that alone, if you've got a large user group, um, and especially if you've got people working that aren't super familiar with, you know, file management and file relationships and all that stuff, um, it can help to just give them the little breadcrumb thing to say where in the vault that thing goes. <clears throat> right, so once the file is saved, um, you know, you can call up the data sheet, and this is the same page that we had when we were saving the file from the get-go, um, but now we're looking at the properties. And so again, this is just showing me all the properties that are relevant to this category. And I can actually edit here. So I do not currently have this file checked out, right? It's not checked out to me. But as long as I could check it out, you know, I could come in here and modify. And it's going to check it out for me, modify the property, right? And then I can check it back in just like I would at my leisure. So the data standard really is an upfront sort of thing when you save the file. And then, of course, you, we can review the information, you know, as you go. Um, now, if you're working on an assembly, just to show you this real quick, um, if you're used to creating, you know, files in the context of an assembly, I could create several new components 
in the context of the assembly, I've not saved anything yet, which may or may not be a good decision. But once I go to save, every file that needs to be saved has not been saved the first time. The data standard is going to run through those files and let me save each one. So there's the assembly. And then once I save the assembly, now the parts are going to get saved. So essentially it hooks into the save function of Inventor. And there are dialogues for various things for like the frame generator and you know the other environments where you might be creating files on the fly um, so that it can assist with all those files you create, not just when you hit the, the save button. And when you get the files into Vault, what you'll notice if you're very familiar with the Vault UI, the data standard adds a couple of tabs down here. One of them is data sheet. So I can actually review that same data sheet for this file here. And I can edit the data sheet in Vault as well. Right? So maybe there was supposed to be a space there. And that has updated the property. So that instead of like coming over here to the properties pane and saying, okay, which one of these, and then edit selected properties, and then come here, or you know, going to edit properties, and then having to add the column and all that stuff, you can just edit data sheet, and all the relevant properties for that category are here at your fingertips. So it does some pretty nice things from a UI perspective. Um, and, but the one thing about it, and it's the thing to keep in mind, is as long as it's enabled, every time you hit the Save button, this box is coming up. And if you have required properties there, you're going to have to fill them out before you can hit OK. Right? That's where, again, the Disable is useful because then, like if I'm doing work that I don't know if I'm going to keep, you know, I'm just, or maybe it's just some little you know, tooling thing that I don't even need to put in the vault. I'm just doing something real quick or something for home. Right? You can disable it and then re-enable it when you need to do more vault-related stuff. All right, so um, that's how most people use the data standard, I think, is to interact with vault properties and specify those properties up front when they're, when they're making a document. I think less often used but, but very useful and could be pretty cool is making documents directly inside the vault. Um, without using CAD or, or any other application, right? Um, and the way this works is you add document templates to the vault. Um, in a specific location, there's a predefined location. You can always modify that location if you need to. Um, the UI is set up to automatically, to already have template types for inventor files, AutoCAD files, and Office documents. If you need other types, you can modify the configuration files to add other types. Um, you can create a document and the pro apply the properties to it all in one go. Um, and while it probably isn't well suited for like inventor assemblies because you have file relationships, um, it works great for office documents, fantastic for that. Um, for AutoCAD drawings, it could be um, used. Again, XREFs could, you know, could cause issues, but, um, and then of course, inventor part files, right? Um, so if we want to take a look at that, the default location for the templates would be right off of the root, a templates folder, and then a folder for it called Inventor for your Inventor templates, a folder called Office for your Office templates, and AutoCAD for AutoCAD templates. Right. And if you want to start a new document, there's just new standard file. This is a command that gets added. Right. And when you're doing that, this looks very similar to the dialogue we had um, in, um, in Inventor, right? So we have all the different categories we would have. Again, our required properties based on the category. But notice we have document type, Inventor, Office, or AutoCAD, right? And once you pick a, a document type, you can then see all of the template types that are in those folders. Now, I just have one template in each, but you can have multiple templates as well. Um, now, the neat thing with 
these documents, again, you can provide the properties. Um, so like, let's say I, I make an office document. Um, I can use the numbering schemes that are built into Vault, um, right? And whatever folder I said to create the file in, that's where it goes, right? So right click on the folder. But with Inventor Documents and um, iLogic, you can do some pretty interesting things, right? So my template here is just a two by, as a two inch cube. Maybe, maybe this is a, and it could be a much more complex part, right? But I have a few different parameters, in this case, length, width, and height, and an iLogic rule that translates essentially those custom properties into parameter, actual model parameter values, right? That's in my template. And so now what I can do in Vault is I can say, okay, I need to make a new one of these parts. Right, my part template, and I can fill out that length, width, and height. So maybe this particular one calls for a 4 by 15 by 3. Right. And so it has those properties to begin with, right? And when I open this up in Inventor, it automatically updates the model based on those parameters that I added. Right? So if you, so, and I mean, this is something where, you know, if you've got like a ETO type situation where you've got an inventor and you do like parts and there's a whole list of parameters that need to be filled out. And if you fill them all out, your model's done. Um, you know, you could actually have somebody who does, doesn't even use CAD, they have Vault Pro, they could create a file, fill out all the properties that are required, um, and then someone in engineering can just open the file in Inventor, make sure that it updated properly, you know, do the drawing, and it's done, right? So the model got done um, just by somebody inserting data. All right, so pretty cool stuff there. Um, right. So we had a couple questions come in, so I want to um, want to see if we could address those now. Um, one question: Can I limit part creation in Inventor to specific categories? I have three main categories. I never want parts created in the production category before they have gone through one of the other two. Um, that's a really good question, and it's going to feed into the next um, the the next part of the presentation. Um, so I'll answer that here in just a second. Um, is the data standard available for Vault Office? Is there an add-in for MS Office and specifically for Word? Okay, so I believe the data standard does work with Vault Office, but the only add-ins that I'm aware of are for, for, for other applications would be for um, Inventor and AutoCAD and, of course, Vault itself. So if you need, if, you're, if you want to have people making Word documents and you want to capture the metadata about those documents, I'd recommend using the, the new standard file in Vault and use the Word template, or, the, or it would just be a document. It wouldn't be, a, wouldn't be a, um, a Word template. It would be a docx, just like the document itself. Um, and it could be just a blank document if you didn't have any sort of um, need to have you know, certain formatting or whatever, um, and have them fill out the properties there. And then once the document is created, like if it was, again, a, an office document, it's created, double click, check it out, start editing. Like I said, I do this literally every day, a few times a day, and it works great. Um, and one other question, the CAD bomb tab, what is that tab in the, beside the, the data sheet? That's a really good question. So if you have an inventor assembly, or I believe an AutoCAD mechanical drawing that uses bomb functionality, which almost nobody does, um, you can actually look at the CAD bomb, at least the top level here. Um, now, I will say I've done a little bit of investigation into this, and I'm not sure um, if this is completely accurate 
it's doing some weird things with um, with because the way bombs work when you upload a, an inventor assembly the inventor add-in writes bomb information into the vault um, but it does it in a very kind of weird way um, and it can be really hard to parse that data and um, I'm not entirely sure how accurate this is, but this is also just a single level of the bomb. Um, so if you need to, to work with bombs in Vault, this is just sort of like a little preview. Um, if you need to work with bombs in Vault, I'd strongly recommend Vault Pro and looking at the item functionality, um, just because that is uh, a much more transparent you can actually edit the bomb. You can work with it. Um, it's, you know, more work for sure, right? Um, but but it's the kind of thing where if you need bomb management and view inside Vault, the item master is really the way to go. This is just sort of a little, it's tossed in there as a little preview kind of thing. Um, okay. So let's move on now to customizing the UI. And this gets back to the first question I, I left unaddressed. Um, yeah, this is great, but I want it to behave a little bit different, right? Differently, like um, I have three categories and I don't want two of the other categories to ever be picked inside Inventor. Um, so, you know, maybe it's enough just to set a default category um, or maybe you need to be a little bit more overbearing and say i don't want these other categories to be shown at all right um, how do i add properties to the ui that aren't mapped to the file or add other ui elements um, how do i set a default naming scheme how do i change the scheme based on the category right maybe you've got a, a, a category and naming scheme and every time a certain category is picked, you want a certain naming scheme to be picked. Um, maybe you don't like me. Maybe you don't like the command um, in Vault that you get when you install data standards that says new standard folder. Um, if you don't use folder categories um, and you don't put properties on your folders, this little dialog is a little bit overbearing, right? You have to call it up and then you have to find the name field, type it in. It's a little overbearing. Um, it would be nice if we could just get rid of that command and get our normal folder back. Um, you know, how do you do that? You can do that kind of stuff too, right? Um, now, again, the easiest way to customize, and I put that in quotes, the UI is to manipulate your vault property definitions, right? Make properties required if they're necessary, um, map them to the Inventor or or vault or AutoCAD file types, um, and then the properties will appear in the dialog. Um, any other customization of the interface um, requires specific knowledge in something called XAML or XAML, um, and the extensible application markup language. Um, it's XML based. Um, it can be very difficult to directly edit the files. I think it can be really useful to have um, a development environment of some sort like Visual Studio to help you preview the changes. So if you're not familiar with all of that, it can be pretty difficult to customize. Um, if you know it well, it's pretty straightforward, um, I think. Um, but but if you don't know it, you're going to need to learn a, a few different things at minimum just to, you know, how in Inventor, how we have the comments property over here on the left. Um, if you wanted to add another property over here for all documents, um, you'd, you'd have to learn a few different technologies potentially if you don't know any of them just to get a property over here, right? So it can be a little tricky. So that's why, you know, customizing the properties because if it's if it's a, a property you care about an inventor it probably makes sense to have it on the file and as soon as you link that vault udp to the vault property it's going to be on the list over here anyway right 
So uh, most of our customers don't really have any need to customize this UI. You can do it if you need to, but it's not trivial, right? And it's a little bit beyond the scope of this webcast. You know, maybe, you know, if there's some demand for it, if you really want to see how that's done, um, you know, after the webcast, you know, provide some feedback, say, I'd love to see, you know, how to edit the XAML files with data standard. And maybe we can either put together a, another webcast or a, a, a newsletter article or something to give you more information about that. Um, now, customizing the behavior of the UI, I find to be much easier because the behavior is driven by uh, a PowerShell script on the back end. So you can think about it like a code behind file for our web page. Um, it's more or less what it is. The XAML is the front end, the PowerShell script is the back end where the actual logic takes place, right? Um, and that lets you do things like, um, say what is the default category or what happens when the category changes or what happens when this other thing happens, right? Um, now, if you are going to start digging into the files to customize them, um, you need to know where they are. And this is fundamentally a vault extension. So even though there's an add-in for Inventor and an add-in for AutoCAD, the configuration files are going to be in the extensions folder for vault. So whatever vault version you have, program data, which is a hidden folder by default, you might have to turn on hidden files and folders, program data, Autodesk, in my case, Vault 2020, extensions, data standard. Inside there, you're gonna see a bunch of localization folders for the different languages. The folders you're looking for are CAD and CAD.custom and Vault and Vault.custom, right? Now, CAD and Vault, I would leave the contents of those folders alone. That's the default file set, right? So you could always fall, if you do some customization and you break something, you can always fall back to those files. Um, CAD.custom and Vault.custom are where you would customize um, the various files um, be it a PowerShell script or a XAML file. And if you put the custom files in the dot custom folder, the data standard will read from that location first. So you can put your custom stuff in the custom folder, leave the default folders untouched, and you'll still get your custom behavior, right? So that's gonna be the safest way to do any sort of customization, right? And typically what you have, the XAML files are in the dot configuration folder, PS1 files are in the dot add-ins folder. Again, the XAML controls the UI, PowerShell controls the logic behind that UI, right? Um, and there's one extra set of files for Vault. For CAD, you just have the PowerShell and the XAML. Um, for Vault, you have this menu definitions .xml. Um, this, that XML file controls um, what you see on the interface, context menu, right? or up here on the toolbar, new standard file or edit file data sheet. These buttons, you can actually control what they say um, and you can add your own via that menu definitions.xml file. Right. So um, we're quickly gonna look at how you might customize things. Um, we're gonna focus on categories in Inventor for the most part. Um, and I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly because it can get uh, really boring to watch people write code. <laughs> um, but right now, when I go to save, um, engineering is my default category. There's no numbering scheme selected, right? And let's say I, and that engineering is because, um, well, we'll see why, that, why it comes up as engineering. Um, but maybe I don't want engineering to be the default category. Maybe I want standard to be the default category. Well, the way I would change that is I would come to my CAD folder, add-ins, and default.ps1 is where the logic behind that UI um, is held. Now, I'm not going to edit this directly because it's in the standard folder, right? I'm going to copy this to CAD.custom. 
in the same location. I'm going to edit this, and this is going to open up in the PowerShell ISE. This is a standard part of Windows 10. If you have Windows 10, you have it. If you have Windows 7, you may need to download something to get this editor, but you can get that too. But this is what it looks like if you're not familiar with PowerShell. Um, it's its own thing, right? It's still a programming or scripting language, I guess I would call it. The great thing about PowerShell is you have access to um, like all of the .NET framework. You can do really cool things with PowerShell. I've you know, been learning more about it over the last few months, and it's just, I love it. Um, now, this file is relatively straightforward, and if you kind of look through things, you can kind of pick out, it will help to look online for resources for, you know, the breakdown of what this file does. But if we look at this, we can see here's something called initialize category, right? And it's setting the value of the category property. So it's a good bet this is what's defining the default category of engineering. Well, you can see this UI string cat1 in here. The word engineering doesn't appear here because engineering is an English word, right? And the data standard is designed to work um, with English and French and Korean and Russian, right? Um, and so rather than hard code in the word engineering in here, this is using the UI localization, right? Um, and cat1 just happens to be the default localization for engineering. Um, so what I could do is I could come in here and I could hard code this to say standard, right? Because I have a category in my vault called standard. And notice I didn't have to do anything else. I didn't even have to restart inventor. And all of a sudden now, standard is my default category. Right? So that's another thing to note, and what's really cool about PowerShell um, and about how Vault Data Standard works is the logic behind this, every time it calls up that UI, it rereads this file um, so that it can see any updated logic. So you can try things very quickly. Um, now, the other thing we might want to do is if I have a standard category selected, I want a specific numbering scheme selected, right? Well, there's logic down here below that basically adds an event handler so that when the category property is changed, do something, right? So basically it's saying um, if it doesn't equal something here, right? Um, and so what I can do, if the value of the category property dot value equals standard, standard, then make my numbering scheme We'll call it, we'll say it should be uh, MPA, right? Otherwise, you could put in an else. So in every other case, maybe we want it to be sequential. So just copy and paste. So basically what this is saying is when the category property changes, if the value of the category property is standard, make my numbering scheme this. Otherwise, make it that, right? And so ideally what that would do, and in, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go back and fix this. There we go, so sequential. Oh, I know why. Um, it's only after the property changes so it's standard to start with, but it hasn't changed yet. It's when the UI changes. So engineering or office will be sequential. When I switch to standard, it switches the numbering scheme. So if I want a default numbering scheme, well, when we're initializing the category, um, we could also, we could put it here, we could put it up there, um, but essentially we could always start out as, um, since we're starting out with standard, it might even be good to just put it up here and set the property MPA along with standard. And so now when I go to save the first time, it's already gonna be set to MPA correctly and I can swap like so, right? 
So that's a pretty easy um, customization, right? Um, it does require a little bit of knowledge of PowerShell, but you know, if you don't know anything about it, spend an afternoon learning a little bit about PowerShell or some edits. You could look on the forums, the Autodesk forums and whatnot, um, and try to get some more information about it, and you could probably get some pretty cool stuff done. Now we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to go through this next part just a little bit quick just to show you the kind of thing that can be done. Right? Um, the data standard provides a hook into the UI um, where you can add your own custom commands. Right? Now those commands will call a PowerShell script, just like I was editing before. Um, and there is something called Power Vault by Cool Orange that's totally free, and it makes it easier to um, interact with um, Vault. Right? So if you go to the coolorange.com website, look down at the bottom for Power Vault, you can go and download it. It's a free download. Um, and it lets you do some pretty interesting things, right? So I have this script that I wrote, and there's a fair amount going on in this script, right, as you can see. Um, it uses Power Vault, but essentially what it does is um, you pick a project folder in Vault. Um, and this Vault has this project folder, let's say, um, the way you organize things, um, you have project folders, and in those project folders, you link into it. Again, copy as a link. This is something Vault Pro can do. Um, all the drawings related to that project, right? So these may be some standard parts, some custom parts for that project, et cetera. But ultimately, you need to have somebody make all this stuff, and you don't maybe you don't have an in-house machine shop. So you need to send out a packet for bids. Um, so that script, what the script does is it looks through the contents of this folder, it looks at the drawings, it looks for any PDFs anywhere in the vault of those drawings, it puts the PDFs together in a single PDF, multiple pages, um, and it sends an email to the email address you specify asking for a quote or a bid on you know, making those parts, right? All of that with a couple clicks and a little bit of data entry, right? So what you would do is you would come into your Vault Custom. You need to add a custom command. I'm going to do this super fast, um, right? So I don't care for the new folder command. I'm just going to like copy and paste this, um, like so. Our new folder we're going to call this new bid pack, right? And it's going to be create bid pack here. So this is the kind of thing I'm going to see in the UI when I right click when I look on the context menu. Right? And this PowerShell file I want it to run is actually this create bid pack. Right? So this is defining essentially a command that could appear in the UI. And you can set the icon and all that stuff. Now down below here, I need to say where in the UI should it appear, right? And I want to do this when I right click on a folder. So when I have a folder context menu up, I want to have the new bid pack command show up. Right. By the way, this is also where if I don't want to see um, the fancy new standard folder command. Um, I could take this away and then I could remove this stuff down here. This is suppressing the default menu stuff. I could take this out. And this is UI changes, so I do have to restart the vault client. But now what I should see when I right click on a folder, I should no longer see the um, standard um, new standard folder. I see the new folder command instead. And I see create bid pack as well. So all I need to do is create bid pack. Um, now, this is actually showing me uh, a dialog. This is, again, something that you can do with PowerShell. 
There's a website called Posh GUI, PowerShell GUI. You can almost have like a, like a what you see is what you get, like a, a design environment for the form, and then it will spit out to you the PowerShell code that you need to build that UI. So that's what I did there, right? And I put in the name of the company, let's say Hagerman, and the email address of the person, and create and send. And again, what that's doing is it's going through the vault, it's looking well, the, the IDW is in that folder, it's finding the PDFs, it's combining them together, it's putting it back into vault so that I know what was sent, right? And I can see all of the sheets. I can see who it was sent to. I can see when it was sent. It went into a workflow for the bid. And I got an email sent just now saying, please review and provide a bid. And the PDF is attached. So all of that was done without any additional software purchase. All I had to do was write that script, right? And then this can go through its way, like this is all just standard vault behavior. Uh, maybe, okay, I, someone logs when it got back and we know when it got back. And then, you know, um, someone says, okay, I'm looking at it now. So we know, okay, at least someone's seen whether or not we actually want to buy from these folks. And then eventually, you know, we either award, you know, the job to them or we reject it. Okay. So that's vault controlling, you know, bids or RFQs, right? And that's somebody who doesn't, they don't have to know what should go in the pack. All they need to know is it's for this project and who it goes to. And as long as the engineers put all the relevant drawings in there that they're going to need made, that's all they got to do. They don't have to go digging through stuff and send, find a bunch of PDFs. It just all does it for them. So, all right. Um, so, um, hopefully this was beneficial. Um, again, we talked about how to install and use the data standard, um, creating new documents, and we kind of glossed over a little bit about customization. I mostly wanted to show you what kind of things you could do, um, and that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, if you've got more questions about customizing data standard, um, you know, feel free to reach out to your Hagerman account manager, um, and, you know, we can have a discussion about, you know, what kind of customization you might need. Because the thing to keep in mind with customization is as you change these files, every user in the environment's got to get an updated copy of them. And as you go from year to year, you've got to migrate them. Depending on what you're using, especially if you're using PowerVault, it may not be a big deal, but there always is, you know, some work to be done when you migrate. So that's another key thing to keep in mind. So you really have to look at the ROI when you're talking about customizing. Um, but out of the box, I think it works great and you should consider using it. All right, so um, a few more questions have come in. Um, if you can't stay, because um, we're right at the top of the hour, thank you so much for attending. I'm gonna address the rest of the questions that I've yet to address so far. Um, one question, can the locations of these .custom folders be changed so we can store our customizations in Vault? That's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I would kind of be surprised if you couldn't, but it's a great idea to store the customizations in Vault. Um, the only trick is if you can't change those .custom locations, um, you'd have to, um, what I've done for other customers is, you know, have like a folder in here called VDS and then a folder called CAD.custom. And then when you use the get command, like you'd have users update their files, you just have to make sure they know to go to browse and then, you know, go to the right folder. So you can always get vault files directly to some location outside the workspace if you need to. That would be kind of like a stopgap, but um, I'm gonna put on my to-do list here, um, see if the .custom folders locations can be changed. Because if it was inside the workspace, it'd be dead simple. I think that's a really good question. And if it can't be changed, um, I think it's a great idea station idea. Um, so another question, Vault itself does not have ability to assign category based on the file location folder. Does data standard add this capability? 
Should it be done through PowerShell? That's a really good question. Um, I think it's something you would do through PowerShell. Um, so, because what you would do, and this is me thinking off the top of my head, um, but when you go to save, you know, you pick your breadcrumb, and then um, the only thing is, I would expect you do have access to the breadcrumb here to read the value of each of these fields. And then at that point, it would be an if statement um, based on that location. Because if you'll notice, there are things like um, initialize window, add in loaded, add in unloaded. I believe there's something in here somewhere um, on post close, rules applying for inventor, right? So this is where you would put it. So I don't know off the top of my head what the property name is for the breadcrumb. Um, I think you would look in the XAML file, could help you figure that out. But at that point on post close, you might even disable the category selection or just ignore it completely. And here on post close, it would be prop category dot value equals whatever based on your if statement. So yeah, um, picking a category based on vault folder location, um, if you're gonna do it through the data standard, it would, it would be in PowerShell for sure. All right, so we've had a couple more minutes to let questions come in, and I haven't seen anything new come in in a while. Um, so I think we're going to go ahead and call it there. Uh, thank you again so much for attending, um, and I'll turn it back over to Ashley. Yes, thank you, Forrest, for the presentation, and thanks, everyone, for uh, tuning in today. Um, this will conclude our broadcast. If you think of additional questions, you can simply reply to that confirmation or reminder email you received from GoToWebinar. We can get those to Forrest or your sales rep to get those questions answered. Uh, once again, if you could take a few moments to answer the short survey, we would appreciate it. It will just pop up um, as we close down the session today. And thank you for attending. Have a great day, everybody.